Hello and welcome to Guitar Ergonomics. This edition of Guitar Ergonomics is one that I really had looked forward to. It's a very, very special edition because with me today, I have a world authority on the Alexander Technique, Ilana Markuva, who is also my own Alexander teacher. Welcome to the edition, Ilana. Hello, Paul. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, your, your biography and, and what you have done as an Alexander teacher. I know that you qualified as an Alexander teacher in March 1984. And I also know that from 1986 to 2003, you were assistant a teacher at the North London Teacher Training Course. You had your own school, Alexander School, uh, Technique School, in Queen's Park in London from 2004 to 2018. And I also know that you worked at the Alexander Te Technique Department at the Royal Academy of Music since 1984 and that you are still working there. Yes, I'm very lucky, very privileged. So, so what I thought would be really interesting to do today was to talk about uh, the Alexander Technique. And of course, as this is about uh, guitarists, to talk about how the Alexander Technique can help a guitarist. So. Maybe we should first have a little talk about um, who was Alexander, actually. Well, yes, it is an interesting question. You know, Alexander was born in 1869. We have to stop for a moment and think about the year 1869. It's a long time ago. It's before cars. It's before all, any technology, really. Uh, from a young age, he was born, by the way, in Tasmania, which is part of Australia. And um, he, from a young age, he wanted to become an actor. Uh, he was interested in, um, in Shakespeare. He was very drawn to, towards the profession from, as, as I say, from a young age. And he left to Tasmania from for Sydney. Uh, he found himself a, a job as a, a, a clerk somewhere. And he started to take uh, lessons in uh, locution and whatever people did in this time to, to learn the profession of acting. And um, Gradually, he developed uh, some repertoire, let's say, of um, reciting. And um, he was still involved with the community of actors. And, uh, and uh, I think he was also involved a little bit in theater. But mainly his main income, let's say, from his profession, came from these recital, recitals. Um, unfortunately, he started to lose his voice on stage. In the middle of the reciting, as he was reciting, uh, he, uh, it, it started gradual, of course, and then the voice has gone. This was very worrying for him because this is what he wanted to do. He started to consult doctors and they gave him some ideas about, you know, to rest the voice and to do this and that and the other, which helped, but it came back. And one day he, uh, his, before he left his, the doctor's office, the doctor looked at him and said, Maybe you're doing something to yourself. And that really sort of it gave him an idea. He was a very determined young man. He really didn't want to lose uh, uh, his acting career. And uh, he came home and he thought, I, maybe I'm doing something to myself, so okay. I have to see what I'm doing. And it is interesting, he started to look 
in, he, in mirrors. And it didn't take him long to see that every time he was stimulated to open his mouth to say the first line of the poem, let's say, he pulled his head back and down. It was the first thing he has noticed. And then he understood that by doing that, he is compressing on his larynx and no wonder it interfered with the breath and the vocal folds. This was the beginning of a journey. He understood that there is some mechanism here in the relationship between the head and the neck and the back, which he later on called the primary control, because also he understood at the time that it was some kind of hierarchy that when he interferes with this uh, um, a movement here, he brings about a chain of reactions in the whole, in the whole body. And it uh, uh, brought him to observe himself in other movements. And he noticed a few things. He noticed that he was uh, doing it, first of all, unconsciously. He was not aware of it at all. He was uh, trying even to feel what he was doing. And he realized that he doesn't feel it. Uh, he noticed that his habit is so strong that he can't even uh, uh, control it. The moment he think about it, he goes into it. To cut it, his lo long journey, which lasted, he says in the book that he wrote later on, in a chapter, a small chapter in a book that he, uh, he called The Use of the Self, he tells about the history, his own personal history of the technique. He said it took him seven years to develop his a, a theory and practice. Seven years of observing himself and learning to, to deal with his own problem. How can I stop it? So one of his first theories which he noticed was that he couldn't separate the self, the self into mind and body that we are one unit. For now, this is, was a very interesting observation. Then he noticed that he has to have awareness for what he is doing. But I would like to go back a little bit and tell you what else he observed. He observed that when he was pulling his head back and down, the chain of reaction was that he often narrowed and shortened his whole back, his whole torso. And that often he locked his knees and gripped the feet, the toes of his feet with the floor to give him more support. And he understood that it brings his whole body into an extremely unnecessary state of tension, of contraction, where there is no need for it whatsoever. Uh, this is how he, he developed his, his technique. So what would you say would be the benefits if a uh, guitarist decided to have Alexander technique lessons? What would be the benefits for the guitarist to do so? Uh, is to understand that they have to, first of all, discover what are the habits with the guitar, to notice them. So to, to discover these habits 
And with Alexander's thoughts to learn to stop these habits by inhibition. So Ilana, one of the things that is very notable and maybe unique to the Alexander technique is the use of inhibition. What does that actually mean? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. Inhibition is a difficult concept because most of us see it as um, in a negative way. And in our work, it is actually a positive concept. The inhibition is the time to give ourselves to stop from going to, or from responding to the stimulation by going to our old habits and replacing these old habits that are very difficult. It's very difficult. It is, when I say it, it sounds very easy, but in practice it is not because the habits are very strong. A pathway of, uh, 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 of movement is already registered in the brain so hard that it is difficult to, to break it and to take a new path because this is what we are suggesting. We have to create new pathway in the brain. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's exactly what, what not only did I, did I learn for myself, but also when I work with other guitarists, I say, be careful about practicing for too long because if you practice mistakes, these will become your neural pathway in your brain. And then it is better to use inhibition to stop yourself to analyze and reflect over what you have done so that you are making sure that you are doing the right movement at the right time. So you have to stop and think. And Alexander, this, uh, 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 in his practical way, he says, you have to, first of all, with any stimulation, you have to first of all think. And he gives us a series of thoughts, which he called directions. Some people call it orders. I like to think about it as thoughts. Because if I say to let the neck be free, it is a thought. I ask myself to let the neck be free. To let the head go forward and up to let the back lengthen and widen. And wherever I am, either sitting, standing or walking, to let my knees go forward and slightly out. So to be aware of the power of these thoughts before you start to play. I think this is, this is really, um beautiful and very true and I know it from my own uh, practice as a guitarist because the word that comes to mind is holistic a, a holistic way of thinking about yourself and your body um, and thinking in movement and I think some of the problems that I have seen in guitarists and and I'm sure you have as well is that they are too occupied maybe just with putting their fingers on the fretboard or playing a specific pattern and they pay absolutely no attention to the head, the neck and the back, which is what we should do first before we do anything else. Yes, the, what I, uh, the way I encourage them to stop going into it is to tell them that they have to trust that we think and eat does. I think my neck free and my neck become free as much as it understands at this moment in life. <laughs> and how did you come, how did, how did you do that? Just through thinking and repetition mm -hmm. and by trust. It is interesting because for, for, for obviously for the, for the guitarist, they are working with the instrument. 
the instrument is obviously made out of wood and the neck of the guitar is very, very hard. And I think the, so one of the, the benefits, certainly with the Alexander technique for, for me was, because I, what I basically did was I transferred the experience I had when you put your hands on my head or neck. And I then started thinking, well, what is it that happens when I put my hands on the instrument? Can I do it without interference? Or can I do it being completely free? And I think that that's where the Alexander technique is so powerful because you go back to the primary control and you then also, once you have discovered that to a certain degree, you very much think about inhibition and not just grabbing the guitar and start playing or practicing, but that you actually think about it before you do it. So that when you get into contact with the instrument, because this is where things can go wrong uh, for a guitarist, that when you, before you get in contact with the instrument, you are ready to make that contact in the most efficient way. You couldn't have put it better. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> it's, yeah, we have to overcome uh, as musicians and performers the stress that we, we have. Uh, it is uh, to, for performance, performers, it is one of the perils, is the stress, the anxiety. And I would like to introduce you now to two, in relation to what you've just said, two more concepts of Alexander. He is telling us not to be end gainers, but to think about the means whereby. What he means is not to think about the end result, but on the journey towards this end. Because we all do more or less the same in our daily life. Yeah, it is not a question of the what, but the how. And I think these are two beautiful thoughts, not to be an end gainer, but to think about the journey. When you are preparing for a concert, let's say, talk about a professional guitarist, you have to trust that you learn the music well and you know it. Yeah? You have to trust that when you prepare yourself for the, for the concert, you will allow yourself to calm down. I say to people from time to time to blow a feather in space like just like that, and observe what happens to them when they blow a feather. If you just blow a feather, like so, you bring calm to yourself immediately, really. And the more you practice, the more it will work. Yeah, and then take the guitar and take couple of seconds before you start playing. The audience will wait. Yes, this is definitely something that I have noticed as I got more experience using the Alexander technique that don't hurry, take your time, uh, do the whispered R before you start playing, uh, think of along your spine and release, breathe out and then start playing. There's one thing that I certainly have learned uh, during the last 25 years and that is really when you are performing to constantly monitor and think about the primary control and inhibition because what I have benefited from it is that unhelpful thoughts in relation to for example performance anxiety are less likely to interfere and therefore yeah. you are more likely to to play your very best at that point in time. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Ilana, I want to thank you to, to take time and have this conversation with me. It's been so great to, to be with you and listen to all your wisdom and knowledge that you have uh, accomplished over a lifetime. And I know that I am not the only person who has benefited from being your students. There are hundreds of students, of course, who have been in that similar situation. And what I really want to say, and it's something that maybe many people may not really have thought about until they try the Alexander technique. I was very fortunate to study with the late French guitarist Roland Jens in Paris. He died in 2016, unfortunately. But I always say I had two great guitar teachers. The first one was Roland Jens, and the second one was my Alexander teacher, Ilana Markova. So thank you for everything that you have done for me. Thank you, Paul. You were a wonderful student. <laughs>